Thank you very much, Rosie. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to come and talk to you about the York for the Alleviation Scheme. Um, it's been a project I've been involved in since it started back in 2016, and I'm very proud of, of what the Environment Agency and our partners have done for the city. So it's a, it's a project, um, it's a team of people um, led, led by Marilyn Sanderson, who was, was a team leader, Richard, Rachel, Laurie and myself. Um, it used to be a much bigger team, um, but we've kind of uh, on the tail end of this uh, particular project now, so we've reduced the numbers a little bit. We work very closely with City of York Council, Steve Rag, who's a flood risk manager, City of York, we work very closely with him. Um, and we also couldn't do this without all of our other partners and, and people um, that, that, that design, um, to, to carry out all the reports, the modelling and the construction of these things. So it's a, it's not just an agency thing, of course, it's, it's, it's a much wider team of people involved in this sort of thing. So myself, my name is Mark Fuller. I've been working for the Environment Agency now for, oh, good grief, um, since 1996. That's quite a long time now mostly around York and the uh, North Yorkshire area in the flood risk management team. Um, uh, and uh, I was taken out of my asset performance role. Asset, asset performance is the team within the environment agency that operates and maintains all of the assets, all of the pumping stations and flood banks and everything. I was taken out of that team and I was moved into the York FAS team, flood alleviation scheme team, um, because they recognised there was a lot of work to do there as a senior user in a very uh, sort of particular team, and they didn't want me to get distracted by doing other things. So I got lifted out of my asset performance, dropped into the York FAS team to act as a senior user for all of these projects. And this presentation, I'm going to give you a very short history lesson of York. I'm going to explain why York in particular is prone to flooding and have a look, quick look at some of the floods in years gone by. Then I'm going to go into the York flood alleviation work, the work that we've been doing for the past six, seven, eight years. How we assess the flood risk, what the York schemes uh, were, the problems we encountered, the plans we put in place, the solutions we constructed, and I'm going to go into some of those challenges that we had. So it's quite a lot to do going there, so I reckon it should take around about half an hour. Um, so let's get going. So York... Um, there's been evidence of people living in York for, for such a long time, 8,000 BC, um, firstly um, by um, Metholithic people, and then Bronze Age, Iron Age, all the way up to the present day. So you can see there, you can see the ooze and the foss um, for all of these Roman times. The ooze and the foss were there just like they are now. 400 years ago, they're just like they are now. And now the city is much, much bigger, and we have the same rivers giving us the same headaches that they gave to the Romans back in the day. So flooding in York is, is nothing new. But why does York flood? Um, we've got the uh, map in front of you there with the two red boundaries. The larger red boundary is the ooze catchment. And you can see there we've got the rivers Swale, the Ewer and the Nid. Three large rivers in their own right all combine just upstream of York um, to come through the ooze, um, which is, is one of the reasons why York... We, it was always explained to me to be like three taps. So uh, if you have all those three taps on at once, if you get rainfall across the whole of the catchment, you can end up with elevated levels in York and flooding problems in York. Um, but we've also got the FOSS catchment as well, much smaller catchment. Um, but that catchment uh, causes its own problems, as we found out on, uh, on Boxing Day 2015, um, when the FOSS barrier that manages um, uh, FOSS flows um, causes some problems. That's not something I'm going to talk too much about today. Today is mostly about the York Flood Alleviation Scheme and the work we did on the use. So we're quite lucky in York. We've got uh, records going back. 1150, I think, was the earliest record that I could find um, there. Um, and I'm not going to go through those one by one. Um, but the photograph there is of Ouse Bridge in York. It doesn't look like that anymore. That's mainly because in 1564, you can see that uh, two arches of Ouse Bridge are washed away after a nice jam following snow and the great frost. Um most of the old references to flooding seem to seem to reference um, snow, heavy snowfall, heavy, uh, quick, fast thaw. And we always thought that York would only get a really big flood if you had that snow melt combined um, with a quick thaw and, and heavy rain. But 2000 and most of the floods since then have happened purely on rainfall and haven't needed the, the snow melt as well, which is probably a, just a change in, in, in conditions. Since 1885, York recorded its flood levels at the Guild Hall, which is in the centre of York, an old historic building, and they, they, they recorded quite accurately to a, a datum that we could recognise today, um, flood records. And they're now recorded on the Foss Barrier, or the Viking Recorder, sorry, not Foss Barrier, the Viking Recorder, 
um, which you can see there is a telemetry station opposite side of the river to the guild hall so it's very comparable levels that's recording 24 7 electronically and you can pick up levels like on, on the .gov sites um, on there uh, and this is a chart from 1885 from those records from the guild hall it's the annual maximum level in York. So every year they picked up the, the biggest level they could find, the greatest level they could find, plotted it on a graph, and you can see there a general trend of, of, of levels going up from 1885 on the annual maximum up to what we've got today, with most of the biggest floods we've had really in the past sort of 25 years. So the Oxford alleviation scheme itself came out of problems that we experienced with the frost barrier in, in 2015 on the Boxing Day 2015. Um, for the event, we had problems with flows coming down the foss. It exceeded the capacity of the foss barrier, which meant we had to open the gate. And lots and lots of properties along the foss corridor flooded, which meant it got national headline news. We got the great and the good coming down um, uh, to York to, to, to sort of show their faces and, and, and to support us uh, through the crisis. Um, and the back of that, we ended up with uh, an allocation of £45 million flood defence money, money that was allocated, ring fenced for York. Um, which was fantastic, just what we really, really wanted. Um, it was we could do a lot of good with that money. It came out over the following months and years how we could spend that money. It wasn't just here is the money you can do it exactly what you want with it. There was a process to go through, um, but it was fantastic news um, to, to to get that sort of money. So we started, and this is early twenty sixteen. We started by looking at York and, and assessing all of the areas that we could we, we could find within, within that York area. So we split it into cells. Um, there were 18 individual cells that we places that we knew had flood risk, some places that we didn't know had flood risk, but we had to try and be transparent. We had to try and look at all of these York cells um, and, and assess them on their flood risk, on their economic viability, um, to try and show that we were using that money in the best possible way to get the best OM2s, the best uh, outcomes, the best flood protection for the money that we're given. 45 million is a lot of money, but it was nowhere near enough to do everything. So we had to, had to prioritize and we had to pick places. So eight, eight in individual cells, we got individual assessments carried out on them, which was um, a, a process of looking at what we knew, gathering data from the agency, gathering data from other sources, uh, and working out what the flood risk in this particular cell was, and then at a very high level, what could be done about it. Some cells had no significant flood risk, but we just needed to capture that to explain to people that we had actually looked at the whole of the city, um, and, and if it was no risk, that's fine. We could just part that and move on. Some were economically unviable to protect. The £45 million pound was great, but we still had to make sure it was economically viable. The cost benefit had to be above one. Um, so, so some were, were going to quite easily seem that, 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 that it was going to cost far more to protect these areas than the benefits you would ever get. Um, but eight cells out of all of those uh, cells were taken forward as projects to be delivered. So how do we assess the flood risk? We started off, like I said, initial assessments, gathering all of that information. The Environment Agency and its predecessors, the uh, National River Authority and Yorkshire Water, have looked at some of these areas over and over again to try and find an economically viable scheme, but, 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 but most of them it, it didn't happen. Um, so we, we had a lot of data. You could all go into these initial assessments and you could have a fresh look at it with, 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 with the modern way of thinking, the modern funding regimes, to see whether anything had changed. We looked at a long list of options. It went into short list of options. Um, there's an awful lot of background around this with modeling and environmental reports and planning reports. Um, but the, the top and bottom of it is that we, we narrowed it down from a long list of options down to a short list of options. Um, and we, we, we used five case models to try and whittle them down, use economic, strategic, management, commercial and financial criteria the score we get all of these options against to make sure that we chose the most beneficial one. Um, we, we had lots of uh, lots of studies, lots of options to choose from, and loads of spreadsheets. I've never seen so many spreadsheets, um, which was which was good. It allowed us to, to to look at all this information, made sure that we picked the most viable one. But we also brought the public along with us. Um, stakeholder engagement was was key to working somewhere like York, where everyone's got a view about how things can be done and how things should be done. So we opened up the, the the hub, we called it, which was an environment agency building in the centre of York, which we staffed um, for two or three days a week. So people could just drop in, 
come and chat to us any concerns any information anything they wanted to know we had all the plans we had key people from the team there at key times um, and it just allowed us to, 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 to gather the feeling from people what they wanted out of it what we could deliver sometimes it was difficult messages where we couldn't deliver anything and we had to explain it to them face to face but it was important we did that to bring the people of York as much as we possibly could along with us and we chose the preferred option for those eight cells in this slide, I'm going to go through all of the York defences, but the York FAS only picked up on some of them. But let's go down from the right bank from the upstream. We've got a pumping station at Holgate Beck, which we assessed. Didn't need anything doing to it. It was all perfectly fine. Water End, another large area, area of York with a lot of at-risk properties, but that was improved back in 2012. I, I was involved in the project there to raise the height of that. So that was already good enough was Water End, so we didn't need to do anything there. The North Street and Memorial Gardens, yes, that was something that had been built. It was an existing flood defence, but it was too low in height to get the aspirational one in 100 plus climate change that had to be raised in height. So there was a job there to do. Clement Thorpe in York, um, it was uh, an area that had sort of a small amount of flood defences. We'll look at that a, a, a few slides later, um, but a lot more was needed and there was a lot of political pressure to do something in, in, in uh, Clement Thorpe. So that was almost treated as a scheme in its own right, rather than just an improvement of an existing scheme. Middle Thorpings or Washington downstream didn't need anything doing to it. Bishop Thorpe, outside of York, flooded badly in, 20, uh, sorry, in 2000. Um, we managed to find a scheme, a cost, benefic cost beneficial scheme to build there, which was really good. Clifton Ings, a uh, large storage area upstream of York, existing asset, but its barrier bank, its, its, its bank that offered flood protection to properties was too low, didn't meet that one in a hundred year plus climate change aspirational height, so that needed work. Birdite, another pumping station. Bit of a bugbear of mine is this one, but um, I, I thought it needed work, but the figures um, didn't uh, make the same conclusions, so, so that didn't have any work done to it. Um, Almery and Earlsborough Terrace, um, two flood alleviation schemes in the middle of York, again, built back in the 1980s, two modelling at a certain height back then, deemed in 20, uh, 2016, 2017 not to be high enough, doesn't meet the one in 100 year plus climate change level anymore, so that needed work. We've got some sluices on Tang Hall. We've got some work around the Foss Barrier. Um, and we've also got the Foss storage area on the upstream side of York. I don't know an awful lot about that particular scheme, um, but it is a, a an online storage area out at Strensil, a few miles outside of York. Um, and that's there to capture some of those flows that came down the Foss to help with the problems that we encountered on Boxing Day 2015, where we had too much water coming down the Foss. It overwhelmed the Foss Barrier. So now we've got a, a, a vastly upgraded upgraded and improved FOSS barrier. And we've also got a storage area up there as well to capture some of those flows. So, so the FOSS is in a much better place than it was back in 2015. So now I'm going to go through three of these schemes in a little bit more detail, just to explain what the problem was, what we did about it and everything, and then some of the interesting things that, that came out of them. Um, so Clifton Ings is a, a, a large flood storage area upstream of York. You can see in that photograph there, it's full. That was taken in the 2000 um, floods, which was the highest York level on record. So you can see the area. Um, I think you can see my cursor there, but that's the uh, the river running along there. And the, the, the 2.3 million cubic metres of water stored in there. But it's the barrier bank, the bank here on the landward side of the uh, washland of, of, of the reservoir that stops that water getting into properties, and that was deemed to be too low. Um, it was also unstable. During a previous reservoir inspection, it has shown to have slipped. This is a problem we saw in about 2013, where the, the, the core of that bank had failed during drawdown, and it had taken a chunk with it. So there was a question mark of the stability of that barrier embankment. So the plan using part of this 45 million pound sounded simple it, it, it's, it's about a 1.6 kilometer length of embankment all we had to do was raise it in height by between half a meter and a meter along its whole 1.6 kilometer length and then add some additional bits to each end because we need to meet high ground at each end so additional work at each end and we also had to make it stable we had to get we had, we had to satisfy the reservoir engineer that the uh, the embankment was going to be stable after we'd done it so we can we can draw down the water um, after a flood and it's not going to suffer that damage that we saw in that previous photograph. 
And you can see here on the cross section, the, the, the existing embankment, we, we used and we benched out um, part of that embankment, built uh, more material in, compacted it to create a higher embankment. But obviously that increases the, the footprint of that embankment somewhat as well. And we've also got additional drainage at the toe to stop that um, uh, stop that drawdown problem happening again. So it was a highly engineered solution. Um, it's only an earth embankment, but there's a lot that goes into that to make sure that it's stable and it does what we want it to do. And it's big earthworks with big earth moving equipment, which I, I like that. Um, you can see the clay there. That's when they, they're taking out the existing embankment, getting ready to bench in the new clay, compact the new clay and build a new embankment as a new height. Aerial photograph there showing the extent of the works. That's only a short section, like I said, 1.6 kilometers of that. We started a couple of years ago. The earthworks are nearly finished now as we head into autumn, which is a great thing uh, that we're heading into autumn and the earthworks behind us. Um, now we've got some other um, environmental work and a pumping station to build, but that project is now nearly finished. The biggest problem with this particular cell, um, the B10 cell, the Clifton Ing cell, with it, it's a large raised reservoir under the Reservoirs Act, which means you've got a panel engineers, you've got a supervising engineer associated with it, and uh, we have Section 12 and Section 10 inspections, which means it has to be done in a certain way. Now it's a construction site. We've got the construction engineer, um, who's overseeing the works and he's making sure that the design and the construction techniques and the actual buildability of it is all as it should be so he can sign it off at the end to say it's compliant um, fantastic that's in place makes my life a bit easier that we've got a panel engineer looking at some of the stuff I usually look at um, but it certainly added to the, the cost and the time of this getting it done right does, does cost more money um, also a triple SI um, I'm very proud to have a triple SI in, in, in my patch um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a good thing to have, but again, it causes complications. It causes issues with uh, with protected grassland, having to go to natural England for the scent for all of these works um, and having to, to, to mitigate against any damage that we're, 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 we've seen to be doing. Um, so glad to have a triple SI, but it does introduce its, other, its own complications and there'll be a lot of work to, to, to mitigate all of that. Um, protective and invasive species, um, that's, that's plants, that's animals. I think we had absolutely every single protected species you could think of found on Clifton Ings, from great crested newts to tansy beetles, um, absolutely everything um, on there. So we've, we've had to make sure that they're protected as best they can through the construction phase of this work. And then when the reinstatement happens, it can all get back to, to, to normal as quickly as possible. And that's all done through, through natural England ascents and work around that. As you might expect from a flood storage reservoir, it's prone to flooding. So we're, I've been very keen to make sure that any of the works that are carried out to that barrier bank can be reinstated um, if we were to get a flood. Uh, if, if we got a flood while the barrier bank was, was, was taken down and we were building it back up again, then we could put at risk all of those properties that we're trying to protect. So we always had a plan in place where within a couple of days, we could get that barrier bank up to full strength again in emergency works so we could accommodate a large flood if it ever had to. We almost had that last year. I thought at one time looking at the forecast, we were going to get a big flood while the barrier bank was a little bit vulnerable. Um, but we did a lot of work to that bank to make it safe. And in the end, the forecasts weren't quite what we thought they were uh, and, and, and we didn't need it. But uh, plans in, there were plans in place to, to make that safe if we needed. It's a very public site. Um, the cyclists, uh, dog walkers, lots and lots of people use Clifton Ings. So that was a challenge. Um, to try and manage people's expectations about footpath closures, diversions, and people getting onto site when they shouldn't be, all that sort of thing. Um, so, so, so that was a, a particular challenge. And we've also got tenants and tenant farmers and, 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 and stakeholders around that as well who have to be very carefully managed. The whole area has got to be cut for hay um, in a very particular way. And then it's got to be gathered, the hay's got to be gathered and taken away, and then cattle have got to go on it um, in order to, to comply with its triple SI status. So, so um, there was a lot of work around that. How are we going to manage that through the construction phase where well, this might not be easy to do? But we did it. Um, and the last thing, it's not really a York Faz thing, but there is another problem with the Riverside embankment. It's not being looked at by the York Faz, but uh, it's, it's, it's on my, my list of things to do as soon as this uh, work is all finished and uh, I, I can start uh, looking at the wider picture. There's work to do there as well. So just moving on the opposite, well, same side of the river, sorry, a little bit further downstream. They've got what we call the Lower Bootham scheme, B11 and B12. They were both built in the 1980s. 
um, earth embankments, as you can see there. Um, oh, where's my cursor gone? Earth embankments along St. Peter's School, um, which uh, stops the water getting into flooding all that area of Clifton, built in the 1980s. And then we've got an existing flood wall, again, built in the 80s, very close in front of these properties here. So all of these properties have a flood wall and they each have a flood gate in front of them as well. And the same on the downstream of the bridge, we've got a row of terraced houses, each with their own flood wall and flood gate. We've got a Mary gate, which is a large flood gate here. And we've got the museum gardens a bit further downstream, which has a flood bank in its own and flooding um, issues. It was a problem because they were built in the 1980s using 1980s understanding of technology and climate change. And we uh, built them um, to what we thought was the right height back then. Fresh look at the modeling suggests they're probably about half a meter um, lower um, than they need to be to meet that one, one, one in a hundred year plus climate change level that we're aspiring to now. In the past, they've been sandbagged. Um, which is far from ideal. Sandbags, especially the, the sort of plastic type sandbags you can see there, wouldn't be structurally sound. They would probably fail if they got a head of water against them. Um, so rather than having to sandbag everything, far better to, to, to actually raise it properly, um, which is what we were tasked with doing. And there's a picture of the, the hospitium in the museum gardens showing we've got a historical aspect to this as well. That, that particular area, very popular with wedding um, venue, very popular with photographers, that sort of thing. So the last thing they wanted was construction machines and noise around it. So there's a lot of work to do there. And that's the embankment around the back. So again, the plan here was just to raise the height of what we already had. We had earth embankments, we had walls, we had gates. Uh, downstream of the bridge again we had uh, earth embankments and walls it was just a, a, an existing asset improvement scheme um, by raising it in height by half a meter um, and we had to extend the, the defenses to meet high ground at either end so this is a brand new piece of flood wall that we built in the St Peter's school area meeting a brand new embankment and this is where we had to meet high ground and that's just just traditional earthworks um, but then we had to raise the height of the existing flood wall in front of the houses. So this was an existing wall. The brick at the bottom of here um, was existing. And the gate, they always had gates here would be in the past. But we had to raise it in height, um, which, again, um, working so close to the houses was, was, was problematic, to say the least. So flood gates and flood walls, as you can see there. We had the large mechanical flood gate, which we call Mary Gate, which lifts out of the ground. It's housed in a chamber underground and it lifts vertically out of the ground. We had to raise that in height. And the problem with that was we had a, a large sewer running directly underneath it. So we couldn't just dig the pit deep and put a bigger gate in. That wasn't going to work. So we came up with a, a, a solution there to, to fix demountables to the top of it um, and raise everything in height itself. Not perfect for me, but I think it's quite a, an elegant way of dealing with the problem. So uh, I am happy with that as a solution. And then earth embankments, raising the earth embankment in the museum gardens where that hospitium building with the wedding pictures in a very tight space, in a very uh, managed area, came with quite a few problems. So the challenges on here were the usual ones, working with people, public safety interface, um, working footpath closures, that sort of thing. But in particular, on this one, I think the problem was raising the height in front of the houses. There was a general feeling that the wall was high enough already, and just by raising it with just brick and a coping stone um, would have been unacceptable to the householders. They wouldn't have had a view out of their down their ground floor windows. It would have started to block light out of some of them. Um, it's not what they wanted to do. You have to be remembered that this flood wall isn't just protecting these this row of terraced houses. It's protecting an awful lot of properties behind these terrace houses as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's so they've got a benefit, uh, a larger benefit than just the individual properties. So we had to find another way. We had to find another way of of dealing with this uh, this problem. And the glass panels was a solution that we came up with. Um, we had glass panels all the way along. I wasn't keen on glass panels initially. It has to be said, um, making flood defences out of glass seemed to me to be a little uh, little bit um, not what I really wanted to see. But I, I was persuaded. I had people from the team uh, showed me a couple of other in Northwich who went out to have a look at some glass panels elsewhere in the agency, and I was sold on the idea, uh, and, and they were installed, and I think they look rather smart now. Um, you can see here the floodgate with glass panels on it as well. 
again not really keen on that but it was it was sold to me it seems to work and uh, i mean and it's probably the only solution that we could have realistically done we couldn't have built it up by brick we couldn't have just put a bigger gate in glass was probably what we had to do but what i did insist on um, and what the agency expects um, is, is a leak test of these glass panels to make sure that they actually do their job and they actually hold water back we want to know before we get a flood that these actually perform the way they should perform and the only way to do that is to install them and then carry out a leak test. You can see here some formwork um, on, on, on the wet side of, of that particular glass panel. You stood photographs taken from the dry side, looking at the river behind it. Um, some formwork across there, and then they can pump water in um, just to, um, to, to show whether it's leaking. And it did leak. A lot of these didn't pass first time around, so it was good, really, that the, 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 uh, um, they were tested and we could make those adjustments so they could actually have a a leak test in the end that, 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 that didn't fail um, and we're more comfortable now that when we do they get that big flood they're going to perform on the opposite bank we had clement thorpe if you remember that's the area that had a sort of a flood defense back in the built in the 1970s but it was mainly unprotected um, and you can see on this photograph very tightly packed the terraced houses there is a, a flood wall around the bottom of Lower Rebo Street here. You can see performing in, I think that was the 20, 2012 floods. Um, but there's large areas upstream and downstream of that area that are still at risk of flooding. Um, it's, a, it's a known problem. Um, this, this is the uh, the, the converted uh, flats on the riverfront. So this is right next to the river. Built with ground levels given by the Environment Agency or its predecessor back in, back in 20, 30 years ago. But again, the floor levels now are a little bit too low, so we had to carry out work to, 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 to protect those. Um, and the unprotected area, this is where the City of York Council tried their best with sandbags. Um, uh, but to be fair, they're, they're not really doing a great deal of good. It, they were just crying out for a proper, properly thought after, properly funded for defence scheme, which is what we were tasked with trying to deliver. So lots and lots of properties in, a, in a prop an area that does flood quite regularly, a lot of political pressure on this one, um, and we decided what to do. So you see on this slide, the, the white line shows the line of flood defence, and the line of flood defence takes into account existing walls, existing boundary walls, um, uh, uh, existing flood walls in places where there's flood walls, um, some gates in there, there's some ramps. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a mishmash of, of all sorts of different techniques of providing that flood protection all the way down from, from, from the bridge at the very top end all the way down to the caravan park at the bottom end um it's whatever that line between the, the interface between the, uh, the the river and the properties we had to try and formalize that into a flood defense and we did that so um in between some buildings here you can see the flood wall that we constructed at the top of these steps and additional flood wall to give the extra height um, that, that, that was one of the new assets joining into the existing buildings on each side. So we're using the existing building wall on here to act as a flood defence. And then where it's too low, we're building ourselves a new one. This was Waterfront House, um, quite a, an iconic uh, set of flats in York. Um, and we assessed the wall along here and it just wasn't deemed to be suitable to provide the flood protection that we were wanting. So we actually constructed a brand new wall around here so this is a reinforced concrete wall with a, with a toe and a heel um, and uh, cast not against the property just slightly away from it to provide that flood protection um, and that was because the, the existing building wall probably built two three hundred years ago just wasn't deemed to be suitable um, for, for, for the loading that the flood water would give it flood walls elsewhere we had a, a part of the uh, a large hotel that was being built they managed to contribute so we managed to get them to contribute a part of the scheme so they built this flood wall for us raising the height of existing wall this is a little low concrete stub wall um, that we had existing um, and by using the metal plates we could raise it in height with metal plates rather than having to have the carbon problems and the expense of bringing more concrete in i think that was quite a good thing to do and a brand new flood wall where we had to meet high ground again we also had two gates um, as part of this scheme. This is the widest gate we have in York, um, part, of course, from the Foss Barrier Lifting Gate. This is the a, a, a largest gate that we have across the highway. It's a bifold gate. You can see the, the hinge there in the middle. So it folds back on itself, concertina style, against the wall. Um, and it's, uh, it's there across the highway. 
Um, I was very pleased with the way that went in. I think the quality of that product is really good and it's, uh, it, it, it has had water against it. But I'm looking forward to seeing it properly tested the next time we get a flood. And the smaller, smaller gate at the back of the, uh, the, the caravan park. These are two assets with my asset performance hat on that I had particular interest in because it's it's our teams that would be operating and operating and maintaining these. So I had a, a, a good interest in, in how these were designed and how these were put in place. And we also had to do some work to manage the underground uh, deep soil uh, mixing. I'll talk about that now. The problem challenges on this particular one, it working in a very tight area between the river and the properties. These properties weren't particularly new in that one you can see there was, but others were, were older, um, maybe less uh, less secure and more, more prone to, to, to damage through vibration. Um, so it was a difficult area to work in. Lots and lots of underground services. We had a, an egg, old, very old egg sewer that ran down there. We had um, high voltage power cables. We had every, every single com comms service you can think of. Um, lots and lots of services that we had to work around. Um, it was a major cycle route um, and the public opinion about us closing it for 18 months, which is how long it took to build the works, um, was considerable. A lot of um, bad feeling for, from people who used all of that, but we had no option but to close that that, that road um, for, for the cyclists. It wasn't a wasn't a road for traffic, it was just a cycle path um, that was closed. And there was two major businesses in the area that were affected, the caravan park and the hotel. We were closing the only access route that they could get in and out for their businesses and closing it for 18 months. Um, so a lot of work to do there to, 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 to build a, a new access road so they get out another way, um, a temporary access road for them, uh, and also deal with their flood mitigation. So if you get a flood, while we're doing the works, they had to have an escape route. We had to work with them to get those out of those, make those people safe before we uh, before the the access um, is is cut off for them to escape. Um, so a lot of work to do, and and that's an ongoing problem as well. That uh, now we've got the flood defences in place, we still have to work very very closely with that hotel, with that caravan park to get people evacuated before flood. Because they're both on the wet side of the flood defence. We couldn't justify protecting those those two. The large floodgate going across there, fantastic. But like with the glass panels, we also like to leak test these floodgates. Um, I like to know that the assets that are being handed over to me actually work. They might look very nice. They might be painted beautifully and have, have, have good finish on them. But if they don't hold water back, they're not much use to me. So I like to have a leak test uh, carried out. And it's the agency process as well to, to, to command a leak test. And on these larger gates, it's very, very difficult to put the temporary works in to create that reservoir of water. Um, that you need for a leak test. So built into this leak, uh, particular gate, we had the, the framework and the ability to put in a demountable system. So this demountable units you can see here aren't to provide flood protection. They're purely part of a leak test. They're put on the wet side of the floodgate. You can see the floodgate behind it in the closed position. The demountable is being stacked up behind it, leaving a small gap there where you can pump water in. And that's the reservoir water there pumped into that and that provides an adequate leak test to to, to just prove to me that the it does hold the water back so next time we do get a large flood the floods of uh, 2024 when we have water against that gate um, i've got more reassurance that that gate is going to do its job and hold the water back uh, and, and that was deemed to be a, a benefit of the gate it was a, an upfront cost cost us more to buy these units and to design it but the 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 Opposing that would be a temporary works um, that would have to be done on a regular basis to leak test these gates. And it soon proved that these uh, these demountable units paid for themselves um, compared with the, the the other way, the, the old fashioned way of, of leak testing gates. But the biggest problem here, I think, or the biggest problem we had to overcome was the uh, the, the, the underground cutoff. So this cross section here is just a general flood wall. It's not one that we built as part of the scheme. It's a general flood wall. And as you can see, you've got the wet, you've got the dry side. You've got the toe and the heel, traditional retaining wall or a flood wall, but you've also got an underground cutoff. Uh, it's the underground cutoff element here that we were concerned about because the ground conditions were particularly poor. We had quite a few boreholes done uh, and we knew that there was a lot of silt, a lot of sand, a lot of um, either archaeology or landfill, whatever you call it. Um, it's, it. It just doesn't hold the water back. It's not like it's on a, a good clay substance, which would do well for, for underground seepage. It was of a material that would allow water to pass underneath anything that we built above ground. So we had to find a way of providing an underground cutoff. 
Um, we couldn't do traditional sheet piles, which is what we'd normally build a, an underground cutoff because of the vibration next to those buildings would have been too much. Um, and we we're also worried about that egg sewer that was down there about causing any damage to that and all the other services. So what we came up with was a, a deep soil mitigation um, uh, method, which was a large, uh, almost like a drill that drills down five or six, seven meters below the ground with a large, there you, go, you can see the, um, the the bit there. It drills down vertically, making a column of like a concrete slurry mix that goes into the ground. And then they lift that back out again and it leaves a, con a, a concrete column of water, a concrete column under the ground. And then they move across um, a couple of meters and do another one and then another one and then another one. So by going all the way along six, seven meters down, they can produce an underground cutoff um, without the vibration of a, um, of, a, of a sheet power machine. It's not perfect concrete. It's only like a concrete slurry. It's, it's a mitigation. It's not actually trying to, to completely stop the water coming underneath. It is just to try and manage it. And we used quite a lot of models um, uh, to, 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 to try and work out how, how this was going to work. Um, uh, and, and it was shown that over a period of time, over a, uh, an expected York flood event, that it would stop the water coming through for long enough for us to manage it with pumps. It wouldn't be a perfect cutoff, but it would be enough. And you can see on this cross section here um, that the uh, deep soil mitigation here, the big column underground, there's a membrane, um, a geotextile membrane that goes across the, the gap between that and the wall. And then you've got the, the property wall that's waterproof there. So we've got a complete waterproof membrane from the riverside across to the properties. Um, to, to stop that underground um, seepage being too much for us to manage, and that was a brand new technique for me. It was it was expensive. It was it was it was invasive, um, but we do have a underground mitigation measure now, which I'm very happy about. And that was a bit of a quick run through, but I wanted to give you time for questions at the end. So um, I, I think I'm um, I'm ready for your uh, questions now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. That was very interesting and informative. And yes, quite a comprehensive overview of the, the York Flood Alleviation Scheme there. Yes, um, we've had quite a few questions come through in the Q&A. So um, yes, I'll go through as, as many as we can before we have to, to finish at one o'clock. So um, I'll just begin with um, one to do with um, urban drainage. So where you have uh, a couple of questions that are similar here, where you have flood banks, gates and walls um, with uh, drains flowing underneath them how do you prevent water flowing back uh, past the defences and what work has been required to mitigate um, urban uh, or to isolate urban drainage systems to prevent high river levels causing flooding of properties and streets via surface and CSO outfalls. Okay well, where we've got uh, drains and the like crossing a flood bank, an agency flood bank or a flood wall, yes, you're quite right. We need to do something to stop that water that normally drains through, but we don't want that to come back again. So it, it, there's a couple of ways of dealing with this. At Clifton Ings, we've got penstocks on those um, drains. So when we get, we know there's a flood coming, we send our field teams out and they close the penstock and that'll mean that the, 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 the river water can't pass back and then flood the properties. But it also means that, that any surface water can no longer get out again. So we sometimes have to take temporary pumps out there to pump the water back over um, the, the flood defence. So that's one way of dealing with it. The other way, which I think is the better way, is to work with Yorkshire Water and, and, and to have a, a designated pumping station um, built so we can actually stop all of these um, connections so you don't get anything passing through the um, uh, through the flood defence. Everything's picked up on the dry side and pumped away um, to, to, to whatever treatment plant it needs to be. And that's what we've got um, on the uh, B11 and B12 and B4. Um, they were originally built back in the 1980s. They were built in conjunction with Yorkshire Water or with the, with the water companies at the time. And they were incorporated as part of that design. Um, so, so that is, is is a better way of dealing with it, but uh, uh, it's more difficult to, to do that nowadays with the current setup between Yorkshire Water and the agency. Great, right, thank you. Yes, and um, another related question to do with water from um, other sources as well. Um, have you had any issues with groundwater rising on the downstream side of flood banks, causing flooding due to porous ground, sands, or gravels? 
Well, I, I, like I explained, the cutoff um, that, that I talked about uh, on, on the Clement Thought scheme and all of these flood defences do have cutoffs, so that should stop the water from the river coming underneath the defences and pushing through. But you're quite right, we sometimes have rising um, water levels due to groundwater as well. Um, we have got an issue with that at the Foss Barrier at the moment with, with, with groundwater coming through. There was a, a pressurised aquifer that was damaged when we originally built the barrier back in the 1980s. And that's causing us some problems. Where there are problems, they just have to be dealt with by overpumping. Um, so, so when you see water on the dry side of a floor, what should be the dry side of a flood defence, if you see water there, it could be a combination of of surface water. It could be sewer backing up. It could be groundwater backing up. Very difficult to try and pinpoint exactly what it is. But whatever it is, it's got to be pumped out and pumped back over back into the river. Um, so, um, so to answer the question, we I haven't had any direct dealings with groundwater flooding, although there is a problem at the Foss Barrier to try and overcome over the next few years. Right, thank you. And we've got a, a few questions relating to um, operation of some of the structures as well. Um, so um, a question here about the floodgates in Lower Bootham. Um, are they closed by the EA or by local residents? Yeah, the, these floodgates are all built by the Environment Agency, we, but they're on private land. Um, but we do see them as our assets to operate and to maintain. So we, we have a team of people um, through our framework um, uh, contractors to, to maintain them. And we we close them on a forecast. And our, our field teams would go out there and we would operate those gates ourselves, lock them in the closed position so people can't come and open them mid-flood. And then we would monitor the flood. We would inspect them whilst the flood's in place. And when the flood's pass, we'll go back there and open them ourselves. So yes, they're very much an environment agency asset for operation. And um, is that also the case where um, you have private involvement in the defences? So, for example, the hotel mentioned at Clementhorpe and um, also with um, road closures as well. Um, are the EA responsible for, for monitoring those? Yes, and, and, and that's where it starts getting a bit tricky. Um, we've got the, the large bifold floodgate that, you, that I showed you at Clementhorpe, the photographs of that. Um, that that can be closed by our field teams. We do that on a, on a forecast from the Viking recorder. So we know when it, the river's coming up, when we close that ahead of the river flooding anybody. Um, but by closing it, we've cut off the only access route in and out from the caravan park and the hotel. So we have to work really closely with those and build in a time scale heading back to give them time to evacuate their, their residents and their customers from, from the premises before we close the gate. Um, which sounds good good in principle, but when you're working off a forecast, sometimes you can be a bit trigger happy with that, which means we can we can get the place evacuated, and then 12 hours later the forecast doesn't come in quite as high as we thought, and we've ev evacuated them uh, unnecessarily. Um, so it's something we're trying to learn to work together a little bit more closely and try and find a way of of dealing with those risks. We obviously the worst case scenario is having the gate closed and flooding all those caravans. That's the last thing we want to do with giving them no means of escape. But on the flip side of that, we don't want to be um, causing their business um, problems by, 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 by sending them packing too many times when, when, when there's no real need to. So we need to find that balance um, to, to, to try and make them safe, but, but, but to try and work with them to make sure it doesn't happen too many times. And um, just going back to the, the properties at, at Bootham, um, were there any objections to the proposed changes to the properties and what the EA do to agree the modifications with property owners? I think there was, I wasn't particularly close to that uh, that stage of the project, but from, from the feedback I got, people would have definitely been against us raising the height of those walls with just reinforced concrete and brick. Um, there was probably a bit of discussion about the type of glass panel um, and, uh, and that sort of thing, but I get the impression it was generally felt that it was the right thing to do. Um, and I feel it was the right thing to do after after having to be pushed a little bit to, to, to accept the glass panels were, were, were the right option. I think nowadays I can see it, I, I can see how, how good they look. Um, and and I'm, now they've passed their leak protection, I'm happy with that. I think there was more problems with, with sort of like the working and the disruption and the noise and everything in people's gardens. I, I, I'm fairly confident that they were relative, most people were relatively comfortable with, with the glass as an option. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got some questions relating to um, climate change and the standard of protection. Um, so I'll just go through a couple of those. Um, 
So uh, what climate change allowance was applied? Um, and assuming the latest climate change allowance, which came into effect recently, didn't apply when the modelling for the scheme was done? It, yes, you're right. It, it would have been the way of dealing with the modelling would have been what it was back in, in 2016, um, which if that's changed, then obviously we didn't take that into account. We, we took it up to 2039. So, so, so climate change, you, you take a, a period of an, an additional allowance going forward in time. So we, we, we took climate change up to 2039 which was a certain amount of, of, of elevated level above the one in a hundred year design level. So we went to 20, if we'd have done a whole hundred years of climate change, then the walls would have been unmanageably high. And uh, we felt that wasn't necessary. So we took it to 2039, um, which means that after 2039, in theory, the standards of protection in York will start to fall because we've gone beyond 2039 and climate change will kick in. Now, how we're managing to deal with that is to, to, to look at the upland storage, to look at the land management in the whole of the use, um, catchment, the squarely on it, um, catchments, um, to try and look at natural flood management techniques, to try and look at maybe building some storage areas, try and look at managing the water coming into York. Um, so we can, by doing that, we can then keep the one in a hundred year plus climate change um, standard um, correct rather than letting it fall at all. But that's an element of work that we're just starting to understand um, what that's going to look like um, and there's going to be a huge project for someone to come along and, uh, and pick that up. Yes, I think that you sort of anticipated a couple of questions there on natural flood management. Some people ask you um, yeah, if there's potential to to look at um, up, upstream NFM measures. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose a follow-on question from that is um, are there any projects planned to um, um, achieve some long-term buy-in and behavioural changes needed before um, works approach uh, the end of their life and um, to encourage people to, to get behind um, NFM? Yeah, I think there's general understanding that we've pretty much maxed York out now. I think building the walls high, building the pumping stations bigger, everything that we've done in York um, over the past 30 years, but definitely over the past sort of five or six years, has maxed out what we could do in York. I don't think we're going to be building walls any higher I don't think we're going to be building any pumping station any bigger. The only way to, to to manage that would be to do some upland, either natural flood management, which is I'm sure everyone is aware. This is sort of dealing with the the sort of the way the farmers are managing their land and, and filling in grips up in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, planting lots of trees uh, and a myriad of other um, things like that. But also building storage areas. So I showed you Clifton Ings um, as a large storage area that was a reservoir under the Act. Which takes a, a volume of water out of the river catchment. If we could, if we could have twenty more Clifton Ings up on the Swirly over Nid, um, I think that would capture an awful lot of water, and that could be a way of managing levels coming into York, which means that we don't have to look at raising things in the future. Right, and uh, maybe a follow-on from that as well is, uh, what was the driver for a one in one hundred year plus climate change standard of protection? That was that, that was came out of the uh, the analysis that was that was uh, calculated. We, we looked at all the various different return periods. Um, obviously, building it to a, a one in fifty year design level would have protected fewer properties, would have cost less. So it's it's all down to that cost benefit analysis. The one in a hundred year plus climate change generally hit that sweet spot of being the most cost beneficial. But there was also an element of wanting to fairly standardise it throughout York. What we didn't really want to is to have lots of different bits of York being protected to different heights. Now, that might have been unavoidable in certain areas, but thankfully, for the vast majority of, of protection, apart from the Foss Barrier, everything really is to that one in 100 year plus, plus the climate change, which was deemed to be the most appropriate for following the analysis. Um, I think that um, follows on to uh, a question regarding standard of protection in each cell. So um, it was the economic case for all the eight flood cells assessed independently for each. Um, and if so, was there a risk of there being a different standard of protection in each cell based on the benefits for each? Yes. I mean, it, they, they were all, all assessed independently. But like I said before, there, there was a drive to try and keep some sort of standard um, of, we, it might have been unavoidable if it had been a huge difference between return periods and um, between the, the beneficial levels, then we might have been forced into a situation where one cell might have had to have a one in 50 year because that's we were pushed down that road. But luckily that didn't happen. We could be fairly standard. They were all assessed individually. Um, 
but we didn't really want anyone to think we were sacrificing one part of York for another part of York. So if, 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 if you're in a flood situation and one floods before another, then you get all this sort of interaction between areas thinking that, uh, that they've got a lesser standard of protection. So there was a drive to try and make it consistent. Um, but thankfully, we didn't have to push that too hard because it just naturally came out as being consistent as, as being the most cost beneficial. I think we've got time for maybe just one or two more questions. So um, I guess in, in that vein, um, uh, someone's pointed out that um, uh, the schemes you talked about were on the left bank. Um, was the right bank easier to deal with? Uh, we, we did things on the left and the right bank. I think the, the, the ones that I picked to talk to you about in a bit more detail, I think they were on the left and right bank. So, so we did we did on, on both banks of the river, we, we carried out works. Um, and, and then that's just all the way through the centre of York. We've got problems on either side um, to a greater or lesser extent. Right. Um, yes, I'll just uh, sort of cover two more questions. So apologies, we're not going to, apologies, we're not going to be able to cover everything in, in this talk. We'll, we'll get back to questions uh, if we can. Um, so um, with the upcoming requirements around biodiversity net gain, um, if the project were to be undertaken now, do you think this would impact the viability of delivering measures in some cells? I can't really say I'm very up to speed on the new net gain um, uh, analysis, uh, so I'm not really in a good position to answer that. My, my role in asset performance is mainly dealing with the, the on the ground um, sort of construction and this sort of handover of the assets. So uh, I'm afraid I probably couldn't couldn't answer that. Oh, sorry. Um, and I guess just to um, uh, close with a last question um so you've you highlighted um several um sort of challenges and and lessons learned from the project um just to close with are there any that you'd particularly like to to highlight or where um your challenges have been turned into a success oh, that's a good question um I mean, there's technical challenges on how we go about solving engineering problems and that was a deep soil mitigation i think was was a good one and something that i could speak to other people about that i, I suppose that the other one really was the, the the biggest one certainly for the early stages was the dealing with the stakeholders was it dealing with the public bringing the public on board with us the york i mean i'm a york um, york resident myself but we have a very vocal bunch um, and if we don't like something, we'll certainly stamp our feet and, and let people know that we don't like it. Um, so I, I think the way we manage that and recognising that really early on in the project and, and, and trying to, to bring people along with us for that journey, I think that was something that I would I would recommend to another project to, to sort of get in there early, um, engage with people, but but not overcommit to anything. Um, I, I think there were one or two places in York where we, we brought people on board. We, we got to know them almost personally because we were seeing them so often. And then you get drawn into you you overcommit something that you can't deliver and that causes problems in its own right. So yes, public engagement, but it's got to be managed in a very controlled way to make sure that you don't fall into any of those traps. Um so so so, so I think if I was doing it over again, we would definitely continue with the public engagement. But I think we just might have a slightly different focus on certain elements of it. Right. Excellent. Great, so I'll, I'll draw the questions to a close there. Um, Barbara, can I invite you to um, bring the meeting to a close? Oh, sorry, I'm afraid you're still on mute, Barbara. All right, I'd just like to go. thank uh, the Time on the Branch organisers and to Mark for a really interesting presentation. Um, do have a look at um, the opportunity to actually visit the sites um, next week. Um, and thank you again for all the work you're doing up in Yorkshire. <laughs> well, thank you again for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much. Yes, and you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.